I got to say congratulations on the film. It's incredible. What provoked you to take on this story for It Lives Inside? Well, I think I was really inspired by some of the kind of ghost stories I heard growing up, these, these kind of cultural stories. And it felt like there was some very interesting monsters and demons from the Indian culture that hadn't really been explored and hadn't been properly exploited, I guess, in, right. in you know Western horror cinema. And at the same time, I felt like there was a very interesting kind of human story to be told about finding and synthesizing an identity when you feel like you're bifurcated between two worlds. And so it felt like there was a very, you know, powerful coming of age story to tell within the context of a very universally terrifying horror movie. Right. And like you said, the importance of having like this Indian kind of folklore behind it, right? Like how important was it to be taken seriously and not cartoonish as well? That's a really good point, actually. It was, there were a lot of sort of real elements of the mythology that fit directly into the creature as we kind of designed it through both the writing and the actual monster design process. And you're absolutely right. It was so important to treat it as a realistic kind of demon. And even as we looked into kind of the earlier artwork that existed, we used it as a jumping off point and said, here's kind of an artistic representation. Now let's make this thing live in our three-dimensional physical world and let's have it be as gnarly of an embodiment of evil as it possibly can be. Right, and the majority of the film, the monster is just captive in this glass, right? So how was it able for you to bring out that tension in the performances by the main two actresses just looking and just self-intrigued by that glass the entire time as well? I love I love that you focus on the performances because you're absolutely right. I mean, so much tension really comes from actors. And in this particular movie, to your point, that the creature spends so long in the, inside the jar that it's really on the actors, especially to Tamira's character, Mohanam Krishnan plays her, and uh, Sam's character that Megan Suri plays, it's really on both of them to create this mystery within the audience for, for us to understand through their reactions that something really horrific and something really dangerous is in there. So I tried to use kind of a lot of negative space and create this tension of what is outside of the frame, what is just below the frame. And we used a lot of sound design to create a a, a very sort of immersive point of view. I think that's really important in a horror film, especially one about someone who's in a frazzled state of mind. If you go see this film in a theater, we tried to create this very dynamic experience for the audience where it feels like there's noises coming from behind you and here and here so that you're sitting in the theater kind of having that same creepy crawly sort of feeling that our characters are. So all those things were done very deliberately in order to sustain tension until we could really see the monster. Right, and I love how you brought up the sound design because that is also very important in horror and genre films as yes. well. You know, going back to Close Encounters of the Third Kind to just even recently with Talk to Me that just came out with an incredible score yeah. and that kind of brings you into that story. So when you were collaborating with the sound design team, what all came about from those meetings where you just kind of jammed on how you wanted the sound to feel? Well... I had an incredible post sound team on this movie. Um, the supervising sound editor was Sandra Portman, and the mixers were uh, Dan and Rob. These are great mixers. And the sound designer was Nolan McNaught. So Nolan and I, we kind of realized that we'd have to use the sound to create a performance for this creature until it shows up, because it can't just show up and you don't understand anything about it. But we felt like there was an opportunity to use the sound to tell the audience about its scale, its speed, its ferocity, its personality. And so we built out, he certainly built out a kind of library of vocalizations. And we, you know, we had this idea that this thing has been inside of a jar for so long, when it comes out, all of its bones are going to be cracking and popping as if they're breaking and unbreaking every time it walks. So we had all these concepts. And then we set about, for me, it was about like, 
really defining the character's mood or, you know, the, the creature's mood and its disposition at any given time. And then Nolan kind of built out this performance. And, you know, it was it was a very interesting process. It was like directing an actor and saying, OK, you, you don't want to have like a menacing laugh here. You want to growl here, you know, and, and it was calibrating that performance through the sound design. And then, like I mentioned earlier, we just continually tried to put the audience into Sam's shoes with the sound design. And, you know, sound design can be both subjective and objective. And as the movie goes along, we tried to forget about objective sound and really focus on what does it feel like in her head? Because it's such a great com- way to communicate that she's right. in an altered state of mind. Yeah, and I appreciate you said that because I'm an audiophile myself. So I'm always listening to the score as well when I'm reviewing movies and this one had probably one of the best scores of the year so far makes me so happy the uh composer of this movie i've worked with him a long time his name's wesley hughes and he had a lot of incredible ideas that were building again off the sort of core of the script the themes of the script we use traditionally um, indian instruments like the tambura and we distorted them in very distinctly american ways like trent reznor would you know what i mean like right the, yeah the snails would so we had all these ideas for how to approach it. And we also wanted that kind of simple and iconic sound that you could associate with the creature. I've always loved how in Jaws, there's that psychological, psychological sort of association with the bump bump with the creature. Right. And in the one sequence where everybody gets out of the, the beach and it turns out to be a hoax, they never play that. So it's like a psychological tool. And so Wes came up with this four note theme and there was so many different variations of the dun, 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 dun. And that really became the defining sort of motif of the movie and its score. And talk about the casting a little bit, the supporting cast from the teacher who was fantastic in the film and the mom as well, who was really a scene stiller in this. So how did you go about casting those two characters? Well, I think both of those two actresses bring two things to the table that are invaluable. First, I can hold a camera on both of them for so long and and see them thinking and feeling so much. They have such expressive faces, both Nero and Betty do. And I mean, obviously all all the characters in this movie, the actors, I'm I'm just so proud of their work in this, but I think it's worth singling out Betty and Nero because they also bring this incredible physicality to their roles. And it's something that I don't think we talk about enough when it comes to horror is the raw sort of physicality of these of these parts. And Betty especially, there's a later sequence where she um, is being chased by the creature in the high school. And that sequence just kind of got longer and longer as we were prepping it because Betty again brought that really raw and, and um, intense physical energy to the performance. So I really think it's a, it's a miracle for me when I watch the movie because I'm like, how are they conveying so much emotion in the quieter scenes and yet bringing that same emotion and this ferocity to the more physical horror-based parts? Right. And from your standpoint, what are you looking forward to most of the audience and critics getting out of it lives inside? Well, first and foremost, what's important to me is that they get a horror experience. I mean, this movie right. was inspired by very much how I felt watching, you know, The Conjuring came out when I was when I was 16 and kids were daring each other to go see it because it was so sp- scary, you know, and <laughs> going to see it, going to see that in the yeah, theater yeah. was, I mean, it was just so fun and we screamed and we laughed and I wanted to do that. I wanted to make a film that my 13, 14, 15 year old self could go to and fall in love with horror movies with. Right. And then at the same time that I think there's something deeper to be said about the film in there, um, that if you're looking for it, that the film is about, you know, breaking out of the binary world and, and trying to reconcile your identity across multiple communities and multiple spaces. And, you know, I hope that it's a film that encourages people to be themselves while scaring the pants off of them. Right. I, fr- I think I froze up on you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> during that answer. <laughs> you did. You did. So did, did you say anything you wanted to talk about? Oh, uh, no. Thank you, Bissau, so much for the interview. It's been fun. And congratulations on your success. We look forward to the next movie you make. Thank you so much, AJ. It was lovely talking to you.